world tomorrow. Herbert W. Armstrong brings you the plain truth about today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. My friends, do you understand why we can know the world tomorrow? We can know the future. We can know what's going to happen. No man of himself knows anything about it. Crystal ball gazers can't tell you anything, or astrologers, or fortune tellers, as I've said so many, many times. But God Almighty does know, and he has revealed it to us, because it's important that we know. And there are two reasons why God Almighty can reveal the future where no man can. First and above all, because God Almighty set all laws in motion. He's the creator of force and energy as well as of matter. He controls the universe. He rules the universe. And God is able to say what is going to happen and to make it happen. Because God rules. Now we're going to see that as we go through this prophecy continuing in the 51st chapter of Jeremiah, looking into the future, seeing what's going to happen to Russia, what's going to happen to Europe, what's going to happen to the United States. You know, I've been showing you, my friends, that catastrophic events are going to happen in the very imminent future. They're in the making now, under cover, only we don't see it. And not understanding the purpose being worked out here below, not knowing prophecy, not knowing what's going to happen, the statesmen of the world are groping in the dark. They don't know how to plan. They don't know how to plan for the future of the United States because they don't know Bible prophecy. They don't know what God says is going to happen. And God says he's going to punish the United States. He's going to give us a good spanking like any loving father will spank his children to teach us some lessons that we have got to learn if we're ever going to find the way to really enjoy and to continually enjoy the great prosperity and all of the great advantages that God has bestowed upon us. Do you realize, my friends, God has bestowed upon us national prosperity and wealth and power and advantages and every material blessing such as no other nation or no other people have ever enjoyed since this world began. And we didn't get them because of our own superiority at all. We got them because a forefather of ours, Abraham, thousands of years ago, obeyed God and kept his commandments, his statutes, his laws. And that was 430 years before so many people say God's laws began. You know, so many, and I can't understand how anyone could call himself a minister of Jesus Christ and think that God was not able to start any laws in motion or have any laws of any kind until the days of Moses. What does your Bible tell you that sin is? What is sin? What's the Bible definition of sin? Your Bible says sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is lawlessness. And God is the one who set those laws in motion. In other words, sin then is disobedience to God. It is disobedience to the laws that God Almighty has set in motion. And God's laws aren't just some ideas written on a piece of paper or on stone or something of the sort. God wrote his great spiritual law on tables of stone, yes. But the law is not a fact and a living thing because it was written on stone. It was written on stone because it was a living fact, because those laws were real and they are active. And there is spiritual, divine force and power and energy behind those laws. You break them, they're going to break you. That's all. It's automatic. Those laws are in motion. Your Bible says sin is transgression of the law, and spiritual sin is the transgression of the spiritual law. And Adam sinned, and as in Adam, all sin. And sin began with one man, Adam, so Adam had to break God's law, because that's what sin is. And so God's law has always existed. It's about time we wake up and quit having our arguments because of our hostility against God and because it is natural that the carnal mind is hostile to God and doesn't want God's ways. 
Now, because of that, my friends, and because we don't seem to believe, even here in the United States, after God has blessed us as no people were ever blessed, we don't seem to believe that we ought to obey God. We think it's all right to do as we think is right. The thing that seems good to us, that seems to be the thing that we believe we ought to do, and that's what we're doing. But you know, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, the end thereof are the ways of death. That's the way we're going. It's the ways of death, not the ways of life. God's ways are the ways that lead into life. And so God is going to punish us. And I've been showing you what's going to happen to the United States. We're way over past that now, over here in the 51st chapter of Jeremiah, showing what's going to happen to this daughter of the ancient Babylon, which is the condition of, well, of society and of... uh, Uh, The political condition, the economic condition, the religious condition, the whole fabric of society of the world today and the whole Western world is in this system of Babylon. And God is calling us out, lest we receive of her plagues and her punishments. And so we've been seeing how God is going to use Soviet communist Russia to punish this Babylon after he is use this Babylon to punish us. And I want to tell you, my friends, that punishment is coming to the people of the United States. But listen, why is God sending it? Not because God hates mankind. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The wages of sin, and sin is the transgression of God's law, and the wages of sin is death. It isn't eternal life, it's death. And God so loved you, my friends, that he sent Jesus Christ that you would not have to pay the penalty of death. The penalty is death, and it's death forever. It's eternal death. It's the second death from which there shall never be a resurrection. It's eternal punishment. That's what God has set for those who will not obey him. But for those who will obey him, my friends, you haven't the slightest conception of what is in store for those who do surrender to God, who will yield their stubborn wills to God and come by way of Jesus Christ in a right spirit, instead of in a spirit of bitterness, antagonism, resentment, and malice, and wanting their own way, and wanting to go by their own thoughts and their own wills. Those are the things we have to put down. Now, God is going to punish us until we do. But listen, if you'll put that down now, if you will surrender to God now, If you will turn to him through Jesus Christ now, you aren't going to have to be punished. Why would God punish? Supposing you had a dozen children in your family. There are families around the United States still with that many children. That seems to be a strange thing today. You go back 50 years and you find a lot of families of that size, but there are still a few today. Supposing you had a dozen children. Supposing 11 of them are quite evil, and they're all young children, you're going to start to punish them as a loving father and a parent should. But one of them is all right and doesn't need punishment. Are you going to punish that one along with the others? I don't think you are if you're a just parent. Now, God is a just parent. And if you happen to be one of his begotten children, and you have quit transgressing against him, and you have turned to him with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and in full faith in Jesus Christ, and you're studying His Word, the Bible, which is profitable to correct you and reprove you and instruct you in righteousness, and you're studying it to find the way, and you're following it. You're a doer of the Word as well as a hearer and a reader, and you're studying it to live by every word of God. You think He's going to punish you? No. And so I was just reading just a while ago, just before I came on the air, I happen to be turning to this 91st Psalm, and I turn to it in the Moffat translation because I was just getting ready to come and talk to you, and I'm using the Moffat translation in the 50th and 51st chapters of Jeremiah. I want to read to you a little in this 91st Psalm first. I want to show you, my friends, that you don't need to suffer. If you're going to be stubborn, if you're going to be rebellious, if you want your way, if you love this world, if you think this world's a pretty good place, and you want to get your share of its pleasures, which are false pleasures after all, God wants you to enjoy life to the full a lot more than people seeking worldly pleasure know anything about. But if you want this kind of pleasure that is empty and leaves heartaches and headaches after it's over, and you are still stubborn and rebellious against God, you're going to be punished. But if you'll put that down and turn to God, 
Here's what he says about you. You're not going to have to go through all this punishment that's coming. You're not going through this great tribulation. You won't go through this day of the Lord. God has a way of protecting you. Listen. 91st Psalm. Happy the man who stays by the Most High in shelter. That is, who goes to God for protection and for security. You know we all want security. We all want safety. We all want assurance for the future that no evil is going to happen. We don't want to live in terror or in fear of what's going to happen. Now, happy is the man who stays by the Most High in shelter, who lives under the shadow of Almighty God. Why? Because he has absolute security. And there's no fear in his mind because he knows he has the promise of God. And when God promises a thing, God keeps his word. You know, some of you parents, you say, now, little Johnny, you've been naughty. If you do that again, I'm going to spank you. And Johnny does it again. And so you say, now, Johnny, what did you do that for? Didn't I tell you I'd spank you if you did it again? Now, don't make mommy or daddy spank you. Uh, Johnny, I will have to spank you if you do it again. So Johnny does it again. Oh, Johnny, what did you do it for? I told you, now, I will spank you if you keep on doing it. And Johnny keeps on doing it. And you don't keep your word at all. You lied to Johnny. You said, I'm going to spank you, but you don't keep your word. Listen, when God says, I'm going to punish, God punishes. When God says, he will protect you, he will protect you. When God says he'll do a thing, God does it. God is no liar. God has power to keep his word, and God tells the truth. You can call every man a liar, but don't ever call God a liar, because God cannot lie. And God says here that the man is happy who will come under his protection, because that protection is absolute. If you want security, my friends, there it is. And the way to come to it is by surrender. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto God because God's ways and God's thoughts are not yours or ours. And when you really have the Spirit of God, you'll see things in a different way. You won't argue about things in the Bible, about what you should and shouldn't do. You'll, you'll understand. And you'll be led by the Spirit of God. So that man is happy. And verse 2, the man who calls the eternal my refuge and my fortress. Yes, God is your refuge. You don't need to have a big barrier built out of rock or stone or mortar or brick or something of that sort and the kind of barriers that armies provide in military maneuvers. You know, they can be battered down. But let me tell you, my friends, the refuge and the fortress, who is Christ and who is God, can't be battered down. There is no power in heaven or earth that can batter that fortress down. That's almighty. So, the man is very happy who can call the eternal my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. You know what we want to do? We want to put trust in men. We want to rely on men. What are we doing in our nation now? Well, we're trying to rely on Germany and Japan. We're hoping that they're going to be allies, and we're hoping we'll be able to control them while we begin building up a Frankenstein, and you're going to be in fright and terror of it pretty soon. If you don't know God, that's your only protection, my friends, and you'd better heed it while you may. He saves you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pit. He protects you from uh, his pinions and hides you underneath his wings. You need not fear the terrors of the night nor arrows flying by day, nor need you fear hydrogen bombs. But you need not fear the terrors of the night, nor arrows flying by the day. Well, it's speaking in terms of the kind of weapons they had when this was written way back there several centuries before Christ. But let's say you don't need to fear the fallout of atomic energy and all that sort of thing today. You don't need to fear anything that's coming if you really know God. But not very many of you do, my friends. A lot of you have been kidding yourselves. You think you know God. You're taking a lot for granted. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. So says your Bible, and God is the author of that Bible. You need fear no plague if you make God your fortress. You need fear no plague stalking in the dark, nor sudden death at noon. You know, that can come if they unleash atomic or hydrogen power on us, and it's coming. It's coming. You think they're building these things so that they never can use them? Why do you think the nations are building all these things? You look back in history, can you find a time when nations built weapons and then never used them? Never happened yet. They've always used them. They're going to use them, my friends. 
Your Bible says so, and God knows, and when He says what's going to happen, you'd better pay attention, because it's certain to happen. Now, sudden death at noon, that's the way it's going to come, or it might be midnight, when you're sound asleep, and you don't know. You know, a thing can happen to you when you're sound asleep. I remember here the last really big earthquake that we had here in Southern California. I was sound asleep. All of a sudden, the bed began to shake, and the whole room was shaking, and I, I heard the whole house creaking and shaking. That's quite a sensation. All of a sudden, you wake up and you realize you don't have any warning. There it is. It's on you. And you know what Jesus Christ said? He said, these things that are coming on us now and on our nation and our people, they're coming like a snare. We're going to be caught like rats in a trap. You know when you set a trap, you get a gopher, a rat, or something in it? He doesn't know it's there. All of a sudden, click, it's got him. The first thing he knows, it's too late. No time now to prepare. No time to run. No time to escape. Now's the time, Jesus said, Be ye therefore also ready, for at such an hour as you think not these things are coming on you. You need not fear plague, stalking in the dark, nor sudden death at noon. Hundreds may fall beside you, thousands at your right hand, but the plague will never reach you. God is going to punish the nation for their sins. Yes, the hundreds around you, the thousands around you, they're going to be punished, but not you. If you turn to God, if you surrender to Him. You know, you read these things. You've read this 91st Psalm many times, but did you ever stop to really analyze it, to really think it through and see what it really does say and what it means. Just think of that. Thousands will be falling beside you, but the plague will never reach you, safe shielded by his faithfulness, by God's faithfulness. You have only to look on and see how evil men are punished. They're going to be punished. Why does God punish? God punishes every son he loves. God doesn't punish those he hates. Well, you know, if God hated you, my friends, and if God wanted to see you really suffer, He wouldn't need to punish you. All He needs to do is just let you alone. Just give you lots of rope and watch you hang yourself, because you do it. You know, we're bringing all this evil on ourselves. Look at this world. God has kept hands off. God has let the world do what it wants. God hasn't crammed His religion down anybody's throat, and He hasn't let anybody else do it. God has given us all free reign. Look at this world. Look at your blanched, white, anemic, pale faces because of lack of health, because we don't know enough to eat the right kind of food. Look at the heartaches. Look at the headaches. Look at the fears and worry. Look at the empty lives all around you. Look at the despondent people, the frustrated people all over this world. What's wrong? They just lost their way, that's all. God's letting them have their own way. They want their own way. God's letting them have it. Look, if God really hated you and wanted you to be punished, all he has to do is let you alone, and in time you'll punish yourself beyond endurance. That's why God has set a time limit, only 6,000 years for mankind to have his own way without the intervening interference of God and the rule of God forcefully upon us. These are the last days, the very end time days of that 6,000 years. That's why prophecy is now coming to a climax. We're at the climax, at the close of the 6,000 years God has given mankind. And we're coming to the place where scientists tell us that very near in the future now, men will blast human life from off the face of the earth unless they think unless we can have world government. Well, that's the solution in a way, but men can't bring about world government, and they never will. Don't think I'm talking any politics. Don't think I'm advocating any idea of human beings trying to get together and form a world government. You can't do that. But God Almighty is going to bring world government because God Almighty is going to step in and rule us to save us from ourselves. Now, God punishes those he loves. If God didn't love you, he'd never punish you. He'd just let you punish yourself. Because you would ultimately, you know, sin and sinful men wax worse and worse, your Bible says. And you would continue, because sin is a thing that continues progressively, and it increases in its momentum all the time. And finally, well, life wouldn't be endurable. If God would let this thing go on for 7,000 years instead of 6,000 years, there wouldn't be any people left on earth. Men would destroy themselves from off this earth. And so God is going to punish those that need the punishment because he loves them. 
But if you don't need it, you won't even have to be punished. Now, listen, my friends. The thing is, we've got a lesson to learn. If you learn that lesson, then, sure, a hundred will fall at one side and a thousand beside you here, as it says. You have only to look and see how evil men are punished. It's evil men that God punishes, but why? Because God loves evil men. Did that ever occur to you, or do you think God is just hate? Oh, no. God only hates sin, because sin is your enemy, and you're full of it. Yes, you are. You're full of it, and you better confess it. Get rid of it, because only Christ, through the blood of Christ, forgiving your past sins, and the power of Christ through the Holy Spirit to keep you from sinning any further. That's the only way you can ever be delivered from it. So, you can see how evil men are punished because God loves them, because He's going to teach them a lesson and bring them out of what they're doing. But you have sheltered beside the eternal. No plague can approach your tent. He puts you under His angel's charge to guard you wherever you go. Well, there you are. You know, I just thought that was wonderful. I looked at it again just before I came on the air a while ago, and I thought, I, I've just got to tell our listeners that, because I've been telling them what's coming on the United States. It doesn't need to happen to you. My friends, if the whole nation will repent of its ways and turn to God, the destruction won't come to the nation. And the only reason God is going to punish this nation of ours, and the only reason that this type of punishment and destruction and this great tribulation I've been telling you about is coming on our own beloved United States is because we are God's chosen people and because we are going the wrong way and we're going to bring a terrible end upon ourselves. God has given us wealth. God has given us power. He's given us luxuries. We don't know how to use them. We're putting them to a wrong use. And power, my friends, is a great potential danger when it is uncontrolled or when it is guided in the wrong direction. And that's what we're doing. We have invented great powers, great forces, great destructive forces, but in our educational process, we've been so interested in technologies and in sciences and in teaching men to invent greater forces for evil and for destruction, but we've been a great deal more intent and put much greater emphasis in education in this United States today on developing such forces that men are turning to destructive use, Oh, I know theoretically we think we're building them for a good use. Sure, we think we build atomic energy because it can be harnessed and put to a good use. It could be, surely. Nothing wrong with atomic energy. The only thing that's wrong is the use man puts it to, but what use has it been put to so far? What are submarines? Peace vessels carrying merchandise and everything to make us happy, or uh, are they used in war? Which? You answer. Why can't we wake up? And most people would rather, well, tune in a movie on TV or something that will carry you off into a make-believe dreamland, uh, just to uh, see the troubles of others or the joy of others or something, and carry you off into a dreamland. Do you know why, my friends? It's because you're a bunch of escapists. You want to escape the truth. And when you try to escape it, it's going to come right on you. Now, I'm showing you the way of escape, and... Jesus Christ and God Almighty is the only way of escape. Just going to fill your mind with a lot of sawdust and a lot of chaff of worldly entertainment and worldly amusement to just get it out of your mind and shove the truth out of your mind because you don't want to listen or because you're too lazy to use your mind to think and you'd rather just let it go blank in a happy dreamland that gives you pleasing feelings and sensations for the minute but wasting your time. You know, your time mighty precious. You just have one life to live. Why don't you live it like you should? Why don't you live it in a way that's going to give you eternal life and let you live it happily and fully and abundantly forever? That's what God offers you. And you can have it. Well, now we don't have very much time left here, but let's get back into Jeremiah 51 for a little. Well, let's go back to 45, because I know we were in that verse in the last broadcast. Come out of her, this Babylon, my people, and that's what God says to us. We're in this system of Babylon now, and Babylon, as I say, it is a great system. It's the system of our Western civilization. Now, we have different customs and ideas in different nations, that's true. But the system is the main thing, it's the big system. 
Come out of her, my people. Save your lives, every man of you, from the eternal's burning wrath. And I showed you in the preceding program how that is quoted exactly in Revelation 18, verse 4, and it goes right on to show the plagues that are coming on this modern harlot Babylon, the daughter of the Babylon of ancient Chaldea, uh, 600 years before Christ. Never be daunted or dismayed by rumors that you hear. When rumors rise, year after year, the tyrants lord it over the land. For mark this, the day comes when I will punish the idols of Babylon. Now, Babylon is this power that's rising up now in Europe. It's a power yet to rise up of ten dictatorships in Europe. You're going to see them happen in a very few years. It's on the way right now, only you haven't seen it yet. It isn't in the news yet. But all of the plans are maturing. I don't know which ten nations are coming in or which ten dictatorships. God doesn't tell us that. I only know what he tells us. But what he tells us is certain to happen, and you're going to see it in your time. Now, mark this. The day comes that I will punish the idols of Babylon when all her country is confounded and her inhabitants drop dead. The heaven and the earth and all their hosts shall exalt over Babylon. For invaders from the northland, that's Russia, Russia is north of old Babylon and Russia is north of Palestine. And again, as I've shown you, that is the, uh, the USSR, that's Russia, coming to punish Babylon after this modern Babylon yet to rise up, has been used to punish us, to teach us a lesson because God loves us. Now then, Yes, Babylon shall fall. O slain of Israel, as slain men have fallen everywhere from Babylon. You who have escaped the sword, stay not, get away, remember the eternal yonder. Bethink you of Jerusalem. We are ashamed, you say, at hearing of this outrage. Foreigners entering the sacred temple. Foreigners entering God's sacred temple. It covers us with shame. That's what our people are quoted here as saying. But mark this, a day comes, the eternal answers, when I punish the idols of Babylon, till wounded men groan over the land. You know, God will take an evil nation and use them to punish another nation. In this case, he's going to use them to punish his own chosen people. That's us, not just the Jews alone. The Jews and our people. Yes, because we are Israel. If you don't understand that, write in for that book of the United States and Prophecy, because you don't understand prophecy unless you know that. And that's a challenge. I hope you'll take advantage of it and really not be ignorant anymore, but know this very foundation of all prophecy. Now, though Babylon mounted to the sky, though she entrenched herself on high, yet I would speed invaders to assail her the eternal answers. Hark! Shrieks from Babylon, a mighty crashing in Chaldea. Tis the eternal battering down Babylon, stilling the den of her city life. Yeah, there's modern city life in Babylon. The enemy surge in like roaring tides, shouting aloud, for the invader has reached Babylon. Her soldiers are captured, their bows all shattered, for the Eternal is a god of retribution. He never fails to punish. He'll keep his word. He's going to do it. Well, I'm going to have to stop there. There's a new Europe coming. From the days when Europe was reduced to rubble at the end of World War II, the plain truth has been predicting its rebirth as a world power. As this European bloc develops independently of the United States and Russia, the plain truth keeps you informed with advanced articles. And as the European common market begins to emerge economically and politically to shake the world, the plain truth brings you the dramatic story behind Europe's return to power with articles like Colossus in the Making and The Struggle for the Soul of Europe. The Plain Truth helps you keep ahead of events in this fast-moving world at a price that everyone can afford. It's absolutely free of charge. The Plain Truth, after 50 years, still ahead of its time. You have heard The World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong, sponsored by the Worldwide Church of God. For the free literature offered on this program... Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.